Okay, y'all. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, uh, of these many still photographers, I'm going to talk about three specific photographers. Um, Cliff Bond, Grace Hoover, and Edward Pierpont Beckwith. Um, and they were along on the expedition primarily to document what they saw in terms of the different studies that were taking place. But of course they ended up documenting uh, the people who participated in the expedition and um, also those who lived uh, in the area around them. So uh, each one captured something that spoke to them that isn't, of course, purely objective, but uh, came from their own personal lens of experience, um, not just the lens of the cameras that they were using. Um, and of course, these speak to their personal outlook and also their artistic vision and um, communicates their own viewpoints of their surroundings. And um, so we're obviously using these different photographs for different reasons, which I will also mention. But I, I guess coming from the art world, I can't help but be interested in, in the different uh, way that these people approached uh, their subjects. And there's actually a new uh, sort of study in archaeology, it's media archaeology, looking at how uh, the person taking the picture was perceiving their subjects. And I, I think that's pretty interesting. So the first photographer um, is a very young guy. He was actually a filmmaker and still photographer and is uh, um, if you were at the movie uh, matinee, we showed some of his silent movies. And, um, and he was only 19 years old. It was kind of remarkable. So he was really, um, so we can begin, sweetheart. Okay, oh, that's my daughter. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sweetheart. So I just think it's amazing. That's, of course, a, a movie camera. But it's amazing to me that this is the... Uh, you know, that that's new technology. So one thing he did is he was so interested in the sites and he took these incredibly detailed photographs of sites and this is going to be incredibly important for us when we start reconstructing specific sites that, um, and he did many, many different things. And it was, he was just, he really was the best photographer at taking the details that showed you exactly structural, uh, things that will be very helpful to us. And then I, I'm fascinated by the fact that he was a moving uh, film person and he did a lot of sequences of still photographs where you really feel the action and again if we do follow some of the people through a virtual reality environment you want to know how they moved in it how you know what was it like to go up one of these horse ladders and I think you know, this is only a fraction of the number of uh, photos that we have um, of you know, <laughs> some of these things. And uh, he also had a great sense of humor, I think. So um, anyway, it's something that, that interests me um, a lot. And, you know, he just would take just picture after picture of, uh, of this type of action. And, and there are many, not just the donkeys and, and trying to get to a camp, but uh, river pictures and other things, and then the men trying to get up to these impossible sites. Uh, one Lithuanian and I tried to get up to. We got within shooting distance, but we could not, we just couldn't do this. <laughs> and, but next time we're going to do it. Um, the other thing that, that I feel he, because he was only 19 years old and he was really one of the guys, um, they're just these fantastic pictures of him uh, that he took of people, just, you know, guys at rest, at work, um, at leisure, whatever they were doing. And um, there are tremendous numbers of these photographs. And again, they'll help us as we try to identify who these people are and we can begin to sort by individuals. And, um, and again, know what, how activities w took place. Uh, here they are getting, you know, meat probably from the local Navajo and learning how to butcher. I mean, these could be guys from New York City who've never done anything like this before. But um, I just love these intimate portraits that um, that he did, and um, obviously the guys were extremely comfortable with him, and um, you know, so. The other thing that he did was some very intimate portraits of the local Navajo. He
And this was often the case with the, a lot of the landscapes that he took. Um, his friends or whatever were were in the pictures, but not portraits of them, but just as a presence, in a, often in a silhouette. And I, I think it's pretty uh, powerful. Like many of the men, he went back uh, year after year to visit, revisit families who he'd gotten to know. And uh, this was in 1940, actually, where he, uh, some of his photographs of a medicine man were featured in Desert Magazine. And, and, um, and so uh, you can see he went to color film from the black and white. So um, that's just a quick little view of him. Um, now, Grace Hoover was another matter altogether. First of all, she was a woman. Um, here she is sitting on the back of this, uh, of this Ford vehicle, and she traveled with her husband, Charles. Um, so she, I have, uh, we have an amazing diary that she wrote, and it's very detailed, and we've actually been able to create a real-time diary and of, of her activities on particular days and what she was thinking, and, and we call it mapping the archive, and we've really gotten a system, a methodology down to do this so that when we do start representing things in a virtual environment, you can actually follow somebody during the day or whatever. Um, and now we're working to sync her photographs with this diary. So I just want to read you um, the, the frontispiece of her a diary here. Um, and I was wondering whether you might go along and photograph the Indians, said the chief of the expedition, Ansel Hall, as casually as though he had asked me if my family were all quite well, and added equally offhand, would it interest you? <coughs> Silence on my part, would it interest me? Then, as if it were not enough to paralyze one's ability to reply, he added that my being the only woman on a strictly masculine expedition would make some complica complications, and it might be necessary for me to stay at the Wetherill Ranch. John Wetherill's ranch? Was John Wetherill still in Cayenta? So, in fact, she visited uh, even after the expedition. She went back, wait one second, Bear. She went back many, many times. Um, there must be 50 signatures over, I would say, you know, maybe another, you know, 10 to 15 year period. She and her husband were so enamored with the area. There's one more quote I want to uh, read from. This is July 10th, 1934, um, after she's been a part of the expedition. I believe I am an experiment. The chief told me I held the distinction of being the only woman sent out on any of his expeditions, eight or nine, I think, and I sort of feel as though my whole sex were being weighed in the balance and simply must not be found wanting. Dear me, <laughs> if, <laughs> if I were not occasionally reminded of it from interested travelers, traders, and others, I should almost forget that I am the only female in the group. The men have been splendid in accepting me as one of them, and we have fraternized over beetles, sunburn, pot sherds, and dinosaur tracks. <laughs> okay, we can begin. So from her photography, this is she uh, with John Wetherill, and from her photographs, I, uh, I definitely get a feeling of the sort of the haves <laughs> who were sta the artists and some of the photographers, including she, who stayed with the Wetherills and at Goulding's and the men staying, you know, living rough. So there are many photographs. She obviously loved staying at the Wetherill Trading Post. Um, and there, there's so many photographs of, of Louisa and John and John himself. And she probably traveled with him into the canyons. Um, there are pictures. Uh, I, I think she has a very journalistic style. Um, she definitely was sort of an eyewitness um, viewer, I feel. And her her, her photographs are carefully composed and very beautiful, um, but they don't feel to me as intimate as Cliff Bond. But I also feel she had this sort of good grasp of this sort of uh, organized chaos that must have been uh, <laughs> in this camp, trying to feed all these men in these different places. And, um, and I think her, her photographs are, are very beautiful. And again, we can use her portraits to try to identify these men in the expedition. And I mean, that's a fantastic composition, but it's, it seems so planned to me. But, um, 
anyway, um, but also uh, she did, you know, manage as a woman to travel around in the in the camps and and do pretty well, I think, in terms of just documenting. And then she did also um, go out and, and meet some of the local Navajo and her portraits, again, are so good. They're so clear and close up that when we've been reaching out to the Navajo community to try to get, um, to try to get, uh, oh wait, this isn't the Navajo, but uh, this is John Oki dressed as one. Uh, but um, then we're able to show her portraits and, um, and try to get uh, people to identify who might be just labeled as a Navajo man or Navajo woman. Um, now the last uh, photographer is, um, is Edward Pierpont Beckwith. And, um, and he, uh, he was the son of Leonard Forbes and Margareta Willoughby Pierpont Beckwith. He came from uh, a lot of money in New York City. Um, and he graduated from MIT as a chemist in 1901. And he worked for uh, General Electric con conducting some of the first experiments with um, tungsten as a filament for electric lamps and other things like that. But he also was someone who, uh, who really used his chemist background to, uh, to, to come up with new ways of developing black and white film so that it really, uh, his photographs are very beautiful and he did a lot of the aerial photography and that was the aerial camera. They hung out of the biplanes taking these photographs. His, his photos are so expansive. They go to the curve of the earth. They, they are also like looking at a topo map because he's obviously brought in almost other colors, um, probably different chemicals that these are incredible. And we have a project now to try to stitch together all of the aerials that we have and try to get a black and white layer of this. I also feel that he was, had, was, he was a big expeditioner. He belonged to the Explorers Club. He went all around the world. And the magnificence of the uh, surroundings and the monumentality are another thing that just so come through his photographs. But again, if, we're, if we want to reconstruct some of these things, I think he was so clear. Now, he always showed man as tiny in these environments, and there are very few pictures that even have people in them at all. Um, and even this archaeologist, this is um, Ralph Beals, just kind of, you know, uh, there are no men around. I mean, you, you see the other photo photographers just, they're always like 8, 10, 12 people around, but usually he would only show one or, you know, some guy who looks kind of lonely inside the environment. Um, this is <laughs> Mr. Goulding, and uh, I mean, he's like part of the rock behind him or something, and how he survived <laughs> being that thin, <laughs> I don't know. He came from Los Angeles originally, but very successful. So this is inside, this is some of the things Mary D was showing you, and he photographed Marsh Pass Camp empty. I mean, again, it's like, where was everybody? He, he really, uh, but what an incredible, and he took a lot of uh, pictures of this so that we have actually reconstructed it in a little video, uh, stitching them together, so you, you feel like you're inside this uh, camp. So, um, this picture is just amazing. I mean, these guys look like they're out of central casting, but, uh, you know, they're not working, they're not at play. I mean, it, it's just, um, you know, like uh, some sort of uh, movie shot, but, but you know, it's, it's another style. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so those are the three photographers that, that I picked, and I didn't want to show you too many. Uh, we have each of those people has, you know, hundreds and hundreds of photographs. So I winnowed it down even yesterday <laughs> more so that we wouldn't see too many, but you get the idea. So um, I, um, to conclude, uh, cameras and photography and video are still so, so important to what we're doing. Um, 
it's been quite a year of progress for us. Uh, and um, so I'm going to just show some images of the different things that we've been doing over the year and, and how we've been documenting them. We've been interviewing people uh, to get their perspectives on their communities and how the expedition affected them. People from other institutions um, who have collections. These events which have been um, really a wonderful way to reach out to people and, and stay in touch. We've had roundtable discussions uh, with people and, uh, and then we did the Navajo Nation Fair where we put out photographs that had no identity. And it was unbelievable because people not only identified relatives in these photographs, but had so many stories of, you know, how they remembered things. And many generations traveled together. So we had, you know, people uh, telling us stories of how things were done in the past, you know, which we couldn't possibly interpret from these photographs. And then descendants have come into our orbit, um, and they bring um, their material in. Sorry about the green socks. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know how to retouch those. <laughs> but um, anyway, Harvey Leake, who is the grandson of John Wetherill, um, brought his uh, copy of his guest register and all these amazing things and did a talk for us. Um, and Peter has been so amazing, capturing so much for us. Uh, and here's Harvey speaking, and um, you know, just the material that comes to light, uh, things we have never seen before. You know, things that relate directly to the expedition. And then we do catch up on where we are in VR. These are Google Glasses, where Pelia West came and did a demonstration in March. Um, and then finding collections that have just been sitting in storerooms. Um, and now, uh, you know, this is Museum Northern Arizona. And um, now we're going to be doing projects with them. They're actually going to come to the next Navajo Nation Fair with us. And they're going to start, do you know, doing catalogs for some of these uh, artifacts that they have. This is Andy Christensen, an archaeologist who's been working on Rainbow Bridge since he was at UCLA. And, uh, you know, we. We, it's wonderful meeting, meeting these people who have been studying uh, these collections. This is Harvey Leake, who did a, again, who did an exhibition um, at uh, a little museum in Prescott. And it, it was marvelous, because again, there was more material that we had never seen before uh, that is in his family's collection. Reaching out to the Zuni, this is Jim and Note, uh, who we met, and we hope to work with their community as well. Um, and then we have these projects where we're uh, linking diaries with actual places and um, photographs. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of different projects going on. So, and then of course going out there, uh, traveling with different people and uh, listening to more stories and uh, going into the canyon for various reasons. Um, and, uh, of course, primary amongst those is, is going in with Paleo West to collect more uh, data um, that we can use to put together our model and doing reconnaissance for future fl uh, uh, work with them. Lith Lithuania has shown us some sites that were right in the area that we never even knew about, uh, and so she and I have hiked around <laughs> many a place. and. Um, so this is Paleo West collecting uh, thousands of photographs in order to make a very detailed model of the Swallow's Nest uh, alcove site. And, uh, and then I just wanted to show this as a sequence. This is a black and white photograph of uh, Duigi Canyon. It's the next place we're going to be taking uh, modeling. And then we go to this aerial photography done recently. And then this is um, a preliminary model, actually, uh, of that place. And then, of course, the next step is showing it to you through uh, an Oculus. Uh, and uh, then being free and walking around. This is our first gaming computer where we're um, trying to see what it's like to walk around in some other projects. And then, of course, 
I think what we hope to do is actually free ourselves from a headset and be able to step into an environment. So anyway, that's it on the photographs. Um, I did want to um, just say that, you know, I think there are tremendous educational and exhibition poss possibilities that can come out of all this work. Um, we'll see where it goes. But I want to leave you with what uh, is, you know, more of an experience than having to be inside an Oculus. This is our model. And um, this is just a little animation that we showed at the end of the movie night. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you.